welcome to section 10. And in this section, we're going to be looking at few standards packages, specifically just three of them. And even for those three packages we will be looking at in this section, we're only going to be looking at a very small part of each package. Now, there are a number of standard packages that come with the Go language library, and that's great because it means that all you can get going and do a lot of stuff without having to develop a lot of the code yourself. On the flip side of that is that since this is an introductory course, we really cannot spend time just going through all of it. Now, at this point, you should be fairly comfortable with not only the Go that we've covered, but also with using packages and looking at documentation because we've been using packages for a while. We've written our own packages. We've seen how to get documentation on packages. We know where to go find the, the packages and some of the packages we will cover, especially the FMT package later in this section. We've been using it for a while and we even dug into it a little bit to look at the format specifiers. So with that said, let's see what is it um, that we're going to be looking at in this section. So there's a package called IO for input output. And it's sort of the foundation of a lot of things in Go. And you will see why, hopefully, by the end of this section. And then if you continue on and you do some other things with Go, you'll see how often it's used. And so we'll look at a few types in this package, the IO package. Um, specifically, we're going to look at some interfaces that it defines and some constants, those are important, and we'll see why. And then we'll look at a few very nice convenient functions that are also provided in this IO package. Next package we're going to look at is the OS package. And we've been using the OS package already, or we've used it before. We've used OS.args. But now we're going to look at some types that are defined there and some function again. And finally, like I said, we will look at the FUMP package, FMT. This package, we've been using it from day one to do all of our, every printing operation. Print X, print line, print this, print that. So um, we'll look at that. And we'll look at few, some of the types, which we've already seen. We've seen FMT stringer type, and we've even implemented that interface. And then, of course, we'll look at some of the functions, which we have already been using, but we'll talk a little bit more about them. Okay. With that said, that is section 10, but we always have to start with lecture one. So in this section for lecture one, we'll be looking at IO writer and IO reader. If you did the exercise or the lab rather for section nine, you will see I defined IO writer and IO reader. That is not the IO writer and reader we'll be looking at. We're looking at the one that come with a standard package. So our topics is to sort of look at the IO writer interface and the IO reader interface and then we'll talk about implementing IO Writer and IO Reader, some of the things that you should keep in mind. Uh, specifically, what IO errors are defined, those are the constants that I mentioned, and variables actually, they're variables, not constants, sorry. But some of the variables are already defined for errors in the IO package. And one in particular variable that is important when you're using IO Reader is end of file. You need to know when you're at the end of a file so you cannot read anymore. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. So before we get into code, though, let's go back and talk about the memory store. If you remember, in section nine, at the end of it for our lab, we implemented something called a memory store. And it was something that allowed us to write some data and read data from memory. And so we had this type called memstore. And I hope you did the, the lab exercise. But we had this type called memstore, and we attached to it a few methods. One of them was a write method that looked like this with a signature, and that turned out to implement our IO writer interface that we had defined. And it also had this read method, which implemented the IO reader interface we had defined in that, in our own package in that exercise. And so what it means is using the write method, we can um, call this on a memstore value and store some data in that memstore, and that's what we did. And we can use the read method on that memstore value and retrieve data that we've previously stored in our memstore. Okay, so let's go look at that code. So here I am in my Visual Studio Code Editor. So let's jump in and go into lecture one. And what I've done is I've copied the code, quite literally copied the code from our lab exercise in 99. I can delete this to show you that how I'm not in any way pulling any the wool over your eyes. So let's go to section nine and solution. 
and then let's look at the lab exercise and so i'll highlight these three directories copy them and i'll bring them back to section 10 exercise Lex lecture one paste them okay so let's go open our where this io package to define what a writer looks like there's our interface writer our reader and in main this was referencing section 9 solution so now we're in section 10 and we're not in lab 01 but rather section 10 and we're in lecture 01 and so we want to use that instead and so let's change this section 10 lab lecture 01 okay so that is what our main is doing and it was exercising our mem store that we use to implement the interface and here we just define a read writer interface which combine both our io reader and io writer and we know that's our io reader and io writer because it's using this so if we go to this directory oh, we should be able to run our code so we do ls we go to cmd and then we do go run main and there we go so it works all right so this is what i want to do I want to get rid because I said there's an IO, there's an standard IO package, and we could go look at the documentation for that. I'll leave that for you to do. But I'll get rid of my IO directory, move it to trash, so it's gone. So now that it's gone, I should actually get an error here because this no longer have an IO package. And if I try to run the code, it should fail. And as you can see, it's failing there. Can I find this thing? So I'll get rid of this import and I'll save again. And notice it pulls in IO from the standard IO package. And it, you know, give me some documentation. IO provides some low level interfaces and what's not. The ones I'm interested in is IO reader and IO writer. So if we hover our mouse over IO reader, uh, you can see. And if I go, look at the code you'll see that i'm pulling up this is the go language code this is not my code this is go language code copy or copyright by go authors and if i go down and i look at the interfaces for io writer and io reader they look exactly like what i had so let me close this here for a sec and so it tells you how you should implement this interface what's the expectation and essentially is what we've been doing if we're asked to write some bytes, if we cannot write all of the bytes, well then we should return, we should save how much we can and then return why we couldn't write the rest. For reader, it's a little bit more tricky. Um, essentially what it says, and I encourage you to read this, but basically that when it comes to reading data, and this is what happened with our mem store. We got to a point where if you try to read data that we didn't have, we consider it empty and that's what we did we return an empty you know error empty well generally what that is called is end of file so we generally treat reading and writing as file like operations so even though the thing that we're going to be reading and writing to is not necessarily a file because we treat them like files well we want consistent behavior for the user so we have this end of file so really for our mem store when there was no more data to be read out we shouldn't really say it's empty. We should say it's sort of end of a file, right? Even though our main store is not really a file, but for consistency. And so in that case, the documentation is telling you how you should treat end of file. And what it comes down to is this. Imagine that when we try to read from our mem store and we had no more data, but the user has given us a buffer to write the data in that was big enough. Should we then say that our we have an error because we know as how we couldn't read any more data if they were to make another call or should we return that there was no error and the data that we have and then on the next call when the call and the call to read and it's truly empty then we return zero saying that we didn't get anything and an error which is the, would be end of file does it make sense now if they give us an empty buffer or a zero buffer and we have nothing then at that point we should say we return in zero and nil it shouldn't be an empty because we're we're returning exactly what they asked for so in my opinion only return an error when it is less than the expected or the requested number of bytes that the user want 
Okay, and that is what we're doing in MemStore. And so basically, you have to be careful of not when you implement a reader so much, but that you want to be careful about. But when you you are calling a read method, why? Because let's say you call in something that re- pretends to be a file, right? Like our MemStore, and you ask it for n bytes, and it can and it only returns less than n. The two possible type of errors it could return. It could return you an error telling you that there was some other kind of failure. That's how it couldn't give you the number of bytes that you requested. Hence, why it's returning less than n. Or it could really be saying is this is the end. There's no more. So in that sense, even though we have an error, and the file region shouldn't be seen as an error. Air quotes because that's just telling you that there's no more. And so you, as the reader, should be able to differentiate between the two. Which means that when you do a read and you get back an error, if it's end of file error, you should still process the bytes that you get back. And if it's not end of file, well, then again, you might still need to process those bytes. But at least you know whether you should retry, close the file, or something like that. So be very, very careful. The reason why this is important, I'm stressing it because if you do a test in a for loop where you're checking for no error before you process the byte, if you get back an error and it's an end of file. You might choose not to process the last set of bytes, but then remember, you got back some bytes. It's not that you didn't get back any bytes. So the key takeaway is with a read interface, you can get back an error with data, valid data. So you must process that data, even when you get an error. Okay. All right. So, all right. I think I beat that to death, but it's a caveat that you should be aware of. So, so let's get back to our code. We did not change MemStore, so our code now should should run correctly. So let's clean this up and let's try to run it now. And notice it works correctly. One of the other things that the I/O package adds, and let's go back and take a look at it, and that is some constants, um, some variables. Sorry, and here's one of them: variable error, short write, and short buffer, and all these other things. And there is our end of file. We should be returning this when we have no more data, and not, um, you know, empty. Just to be consistent with other readers and so on. So let's go back to our implementation of MemStore then, and let's go to the read method. This was returning MemStore that empty. So we will return io dot eof instead, and so we simply need to return io dot eof. And if we store save that, it pulls it in. I don't have any reason to change our writer to return any of the other variables defined, the error variables defined here, because I don't think any of them sort of are appropriate for our write. The one that is closest is probably error short write, but I think that our um, you know, um, we can. So basically, a short write means that the write accepted fewer bytes than requested.、And、that is certainly the case,、um, but we don't have any failure out of failure. So I think that's fine to leave our own custom、um, error type there. And so let me close this. And there's only one other thing. So for the types that we have defined, well, we do not need this empty type anymore. Okay.、Um, so I think our code should still run. It still runs, as you can see. All right, so that doesn't really tell you much, but we've updated our implementation of MemStore to be a little bit more consistent. There are some nice, convenient functions in the I/O package that we will cover in the next lecture. But I want to show you something. Let me get rid of this. I was sort of keeping a count of the total number of bytes we wrote, so that I can allocate a buffer big enough to just read it all in one go. But I decided to just read one byte at a time to show you that how. We can read it in any number of ways, and it should still work. Let me do this. Let's get rid of these lines, and I'll even get rid of this, and I'll show you a different way in which I can get the same result. So I'll change this to be io that write string and rewrite her, and there we go. And I'll change both of these io that write string rewrite. Okay, so. Let's get rid of this, this, and this. Then finally, I want to use io that copy, and I'll say os that std out and our read writer. Okay. I promise you that we will cover io that write string and io that copy in the next lecture. 
But what I want to show you is how convenient and because of these interfaces and they're so simple that you can just reuse them very, very easily. So that's a lowercase t. And so I'm using a function from the IO package called write string. And what it does is it simply takes a writer. Notice it's an IO writer interface because it's in the IO package. So just simply say, I take a writer and a string. And then it takes that and convert it to a byte and write it to the writer. That's all it needs is a writer. So the fact that our object here implements both read and write, that's irrelevant. We, it just simply needs a writer. And for our copy, it takes a writer as the destination and the source is a reader. Well, fortunately, our variable has the value for a memstore which implements a reader. So this copy function can read from our men store and write the result out to this writer. And this writer is a OS that standard out. Standard out represents your monitor, essentially your display. And so this is a value which implements the write method. Okay. For, so the writer interface, IO writer, and we implement the IO reader. So now we can use the standard, um, Fun the functions from the standard IO library, even though we don't have to do any explicit, you know, implement or anything. So let's see if we get, notice how much we simplify our code. And so let's see if we still get the same result when we run our code. And it works exactly the same. So it's for these reasons that I really like how we can easily implement interfaces in Go and reuse them and build on top of them. And we see, a or we will see a little bit more of that in the next lecture. No exercise for this lecture. I just wanted to show you how we can take some things that we have already written and easily modify to work with existing code. But we didn't have to do a whole lot. We had already sort of implemented. You can say I cheated because I knew of the IO interface. So I made our IO interface the same, but it was a very simple interface. And it goes back to what we did when we talk about interfaces in section nine. Interfaces in Go are meant to be simple to imp implement. So if you keep your interfaces small, they'll have wider use and it's easier and quicker to understand a small interface than an interface that defines a whole lot. Okay, that's it. See you in the next lecture. Take care. Welcome to lecture two in section 10. In this lecture, we're going to be looking at a few functions from the IO package. Now keep in mind that we're not going to be covering all the functions and these are not even the most important functions. It's just a few that I want to point out to you. Functions we want to look at are what call convenient functions. The first one is write string. The next one is the copy function. The last function we're going to look at is the pipe function. Let's talk about the IO copy function. I'm skipping the IO write one write string because that's pretty straightforward. So it's nothing to really illustrate. With IO copy, it copies byte from an IO reader value to an IO writer value. So you give IO copy these two values, a reader and a writer, and it takes care of just copying the data until it encounters an error. The IO copy function also returns how many bytes has been copied and an error if it encounters an error. But keep in mind that if the IO copy encounters EOF on the reader, that's not considered error. If you're reading from a reader and you read the end of file or the end of data, that is a valid condition for to be able to read when you're reading. So let's say we have an IO reader value and we have an IO writer value. What the IO copy function does for us is to invoke the read method on the reader value and then just call write on the writer. So let's look at IO pipe. IO pipe is slightly different than copy. And what it does is it creates an in memory reader and writer. Why an in memory reader and writer? Well, because that's very efficient and you don't have to worry about the implementation of that reader and writer that it creates. But by creating the reader and writer, it connects them and it connects them in a very interesting way. And basically what it allows is that if you were to try and read from a pipe, well, it will actually read data that was written by the writer. And so in a way it operates like a channel because if there's no writer to write data to the pipe, then the reader, when it tries to read, it blocks. It doesn't get an error, it blocks. So that's as important because when you use IO pipe, it is there just waiting. It spins up a go routine that just blocks waiting for a writer to write data 
and then the reader can read. And then it captures the data right through in memory. And so there's no buffering or writing it to somewhere else. And so it's very, very efficient. So the way I like to think of a pipe is quite literally like some one way um, pipe that you might hold in your hand, a piece of pipe, and you can just look down one end to the other end. And I sort of think of this also like a channel, like I said, in that data could come in one end, which is when someone write to it, that's how data gets into the pipe. And then you can remove it by reading from the other end of that pipe. So let's imagine that we had a producer that's producing some data and we had a consumer that wanted, needs to consume that data. What we can do is create a pipe and have our producer write into one end of the pipe and the consumer read out the other end of the pipe. And that's it. Okay, so let's jump to the code now. So here I am in my Visual Studio Code Editor and we could see that I'm in section 10 and lecture two. And I want to start by reusing some code we've already written. So I'll go back to lecture one, if you remember that we had some code that we wrote. And so I'll copy these two directories. I'll highlight them and say copy, close that, and then come and paste them here. Now, what's so special about the example we had there? Well, we modify our main that go such that it used IO write string and IO copy. So our objective now is to write our own write string. And so let's do that. Well, before we actually write our own write string, why don't we run the code and make sure it works? So we copy this from lecture one and we're now in lecture two. So let's update that to make sure. So we point into the one that's in our directory. Not that it really matters much because we're not changing that code anyway. And we run our code and okay, it's working these strings in one after the other. Okay. So let's now write our own write function. Now, before we write it, let's look at the signature of the existing write function. So the signature for the IO write string says it accepts a writer as the first parameter, a string as the second parameter, and returns two values, the number of bytes written and an error. So let's just copy that and write the same thing. This is our description that I'll put for our write string. Write string converts a string to a slice of bytes and then writes it to an IO write. We can do that. That is essentially our function signature. Let's close this so we can get some room. Now, the one thing we'd like to do is to make sure that we don't try to call write on a nil value. So we should test that. I think we can use short write. And basically, short write means that a write accepted fewer bytes then request it, which is the case for us if we have an error, but fail to return an explicit error. So I'll say that it certainly fits this case. So now we need to write the data. So, and that's a nice shorthand to just say, return the two values from this function as our return value. So now we need to see if this still works. Let's remove this. Let's go back here and rerun the code and it looks identical. All right, no different. So that's how simple it is to do write string, but we don't even have to write this simple function because it's provided for us as a nice convenient function because these are things you might find yourself doing where you wanna write a string to a writer. Knowing that a writer takes slice of bytes, you don't have to keep casting it yourself. The next function we wanna write implement is IO copy. So let's look at copy. So copy says it takes a destination as a writer, a source as a reader, and returns the number of bytes written as in 64 and an error message. It also tells you that oh, I copy um, returns an error nil if it encounters EOF. So let's write our copy function. So if we look at my copy function, it says you have destination IO writer, source IO reader, and return in 64. Now I can change this to written, so now let's go through and look at what we need to do in copy. I did not check to ensure that all we have non-nil values, but we can do that. We can add a check for that to make sure that if we recall with either nil destination or a nil source, we don't like cause a panic. And so I think the one no progress seemed to make sense. I haven't tested the standard IO copy to see what it returns if you give it nil values. So I'm just, thinking of how I might implement this. Okay, so that takes care of our parameter, making sure we have valid destination or source. Then we make a buffer because we need some place to be able to read data from the source and then use that to write it to the destination. So we're in a for loop and we're saying if there's no error 
and then we try to read from our source into p why 256 because that's just a number i chose you can choose 500 if you like or a thousand whatever makes sense to you once we have read some data we store how much we read in c so at this point we can now say that if we've read some data any amount of data even if it was one byte once it's more than zero we should write that but we don't write want to write all of p because remember p is like 500 bytes and maybe we just read one byte so we just want to write how much we've read and so that's why we have p and we slice it this way and we return from the writer any error message we store it in error and then of course we can override at this point how much data we've written because we already used that value here so now we can override this and now we can use this to update the written count remember this is an int 64 and we're dealing with int here so we have to cast it so this takes care of if we read any data now notice we didn't check for read error first because like we said when we talk about reading is that you must process the bytes that is returned from your read even if there was an error so now we can process worry about errors so we check and see if the reader return io and a file so we just simply do return and then return how much data we've written so far on whatever error we got back from write. If we didn't get end of file from the reader, did we get any other error from the reader, like fail to read or any, something else? So if we got one of those, then we should return how many bytes we were able to write to our destination so far and that error message that we got from the reader. If we didn't get any error from our reader when we read, well, then we should go back around and try to read again and then repeat the process. If this is correct, I should be able to use my own implementation of copy and we should see the same result. So, and it works exactly the same way as before. Now we've looked at how to implement write string and how to implement copy. The next thing we wanna look at is how to use the pipe function. For that, I wanna start off with a very different example. So let's take a look. So what I have is a slice of strings. In this example, I have three strings. In my main program, I have a weight group. So I've, I make a channel. I call my producer with a pointer to the weight group. So now that we know about pointer, we can declare our weight group here within main and pass a pointer to it. We pass the channel. So we tell our producer to produce some data into this channel. And we tell our consumer to consume some data. So let's look at our producer first. Our producer simply writes, send some strings into this channel, which we call out. After we finish iteration over the slice, we simply close that channel. For the consumer, it ranges over the channel and prints out the value. This is all good, and so our program should run correctly. So let's see. This is exactly what we expect. Well, the reason I'm starting with channel is because I want to show you how we can change this to use IO reader and writer and then how a pipe would help us. So let's make our first change. So let's look at the producer first. So we're still taking a pointer to our sync that weight group. And so that part of it didn't change. The only part that changed is how we are sending the data. Before, out was a channel. So we've changed that so that now instead we're using IO write string. And so let's look at our consumer. Our consumer now is reading data. So it just needs some place from which it can read some data. And so we can loop over this reading so long as we don't have any error. Now it's interesting to note that only time we exit get out of this go routine is if we fail to read. So let's run our code and see what happens. And notice we have an issue. And what we have is go routines are asleep. Now, why is that? Well, it looked like if it sort of worked, we were able to send our data, but somehow something was deadlocked. What was it that was waiting? Well, we no went through and we saw that oh, the producer exited. So it wasn't the producer that was blocked. And we can see here from our code where exactly um, it actually died. So if we look at like line 28, for example, we go up here, line 28, is inside of our consumer. So the reason why is because our consumer never exited and it's just waiting, waiting, waiting. We will have a go routine inside consumer waiting, plus we have the main go routine waiting for that to notify that we can complete. 
So both goal routines are blocked. So no progress. So the way to fix that is we want an error to occur when we finish writing data. So we need the producer to signal that it's finished with writing data. But notice so far our producer is only using IO Writer and the only method available to it is to write. So if we use out that, we only have the right methods. So what is it that we need to say that oh, we have completed writing? So it turns out that what we're asking our producer to take is a, just a writer and our consumer to take a reader. But we can do slightly better. The pipe function doesn't return IO reader and IO writer, but it actually return pipe writer and pipe reader. Pipe writer and pipe reader have more than just read and write methods. And so we can use that to say that oh, we want to close the pipe. So let's look at that. So before we look at what change we need to make in our code so that we can connect our consumer producer with a pipe, let's take a look at, again, at the return value from IO pipe. So if I do IO that pipe, and notice there's a pipe reader and a pipe writer. So let's look at the pipe writer. And I can click here and, or I can just look at the documentation. And it says, okay, it's half of the pipe. But more than that, we can see that for a pipe writer, that you have this thing that's a pointer to a pipe. Now, what is this pipe? Well, a pipe, in addition to having, you know, place to store data and so on, it has some other methods attached to it. It has a read method attached to it, and it also have a write method, and it has a close method attached to it. So we can see that you can close a pipe. So you can close the reader or you can close the writer. And so that is exactly what we're going to use to signal, or you can just simply say close. But that is exactly what we're going to use to signal that we have no more data to send on the pipe. So let's remove this and now look at our producer. Our producer takes a write closer. A write closer is simply an interface in the IO package that has a writer and a closer. And what is the closer? It just simply has the close method. And so since our producer requires something that it can write and also close, which we can use to do write string, and then we can say close that. Well, and we just saw that in the IO code, it implemented close method for the pipe. So now that's the only change we really need to make to our producer is that it should close the pipe after it finished or close this writer after it finished writing data. That is going to be a signal to our consumer that when it's trying to read data, if it encounters an error, that it should stop. Now, the only difference for us now is that if we read nil or end of file, and we read more than zero bytes, then we should try to print it out. And of course, we don't want to print out everything, the slice of the size of our slice, because that's an error. What we really want to do is slice how much bytes we were able to read. Make sense? And so now, when we go back and we run our code, it doesn't crash this time. So this is very contrived, but I wanted to show you how you can have a consumer that expect to read data from somewhere, a producer that can write data somewhere, specifically write and close the data, which is what we did with the channel. We were writing data, and at the end of writing data, we closed it. And so there's really not a big difference with how we use in the producer, whether it's a channel or with a write closer. And it works exactly the same. Now, whether you should use a channel or a pipe, that's going to depend on your application. I think if you're mostly dealing with bytes, you might want to consider like the IO interfaces over a channel, but you should probably profile to see which one give you better performance. So that's it for this lecture. Do the reading assignment and make sure that all you understand the IO package and some of the methods that are available and the types and check out the exercise, which I will cover in your supplemental video. Take care. See you in the next lecture. Bye. So let's take a look at your exercise for lecture two.
So we'll jump down to stub and open up exercise two. And let's take a look at this readme. So what you're going to be doing is implementing a record writer. Now, record writer is basically every time you call write on a record writer interface, it wraps whatever you give it in a header and a footer. So let's read. Complete the implementation of a type called record writer such that it implements IO writer interface. We're only going to worry about one side of this for a record writer, and that is the write interface only. The use case is that a record writer wraps its input with a record header and a record footer. Now, you might think this is pretty contrived, but I've had to do this sort of stuff several times when I used to do embedded programming. It's basically how you sort of implement um, like encoding or sending data over wire. It's like somebody might, or another part of the application will give you some data to send over, let's say, um, USB or the network. And what you do is you wrap it with a header so that on the other side, you can start reading that header to know what is it that you're getting. And then you put a footer on it to say, well, this is how um, the checksum or the tail of it. So I'm finished with this particular message. So it's basically when you're doing message oriented um, transmission. And so I just simply call it a header, which can be anything. And footer, again, can be anything that makes sense to you. But we'll keep it very simple in this um, exercise. The data between the header and footer is on change. So again, you're not allowed to change what you're given as the payload we call it a payload right you can wrap it up how much you want or encode it or something but you must be able to recover that data so the first to do is to declare a type record writer which i sort of started for you but there's some missing parts and i'll show you that in a minute and so that is in here so record writer and so if we look at a record writer that go class well this is our header format and this is our record writer and again i started it for you now, why do I have an embedded value? Because remember, this is a struct. Why do I have an embedded field of IO writer? Well, that's because we're going to be implementing write on our record writer, but it turns around and write that data out to some other writer. It makes sense? So we're wrapping a writer is one way to think of it. And so the next function is to write a new record writer. And with this, we've seen with our mem store. It basically is a nice function. You could think of it of an allocator or something like that. It allows us to properly initialize a record writer value. And so it takes as a parameter a higher writer, which is some destination that we'd like to write to. And so we wrap our stuff first and then write it out to the destination. And this is going to make sense when we run it. All right. So the third thing is to implement the write function. And so when a user call write on a record writer value, it will prepend the error record header and X, where X is a number. So each time you call it, it gives it increments and uses a different value for X. And of course, since it's wrapping it, you the header and footer should match. So the record footer footer X should match the X used in record header. The data remains unchanged between the error and the writer, and x keep increase is the number that's increasing. Finally, you want to implement a stringer interface for a record writer, and the string method simply return how many records were written, how many records, not how many bytes, but how many records. So, for example, if you call, you know, record writer twenty times, it should say twenty records were written because that's what it's doing, writing records. And then we have some test and so on that you can run and you don't need to worry about the implementation of the test all you need to do is worry about making sure that you finish the implementation you can find what's missing by going to each one of these files so the first one is you need to complete the definition for our type and then um, to do two is to implement the record writer and then of course um, the writer io writer interface and then finally the stringer interface and all these tests will help you in making sure that how you implement them appropriately and correctly then finally we have our main that go application which creates a memory store and then it writes um call write record to write some data into it what does write record do write records accept an io writer which our mem store is an io writer and write records wrap our mem store in this new record right and then it just simply call write string to 
this record writer, right? Because that's what we're storing in W. And so if this is working correctly, then each one of these messages should be written as a record, meaning that it should have a header and a footer around it. And so after that's completed, we can then print out some information about how many records were written. And then we can copy that data from our mem store to the output standard out to see what it looks like. Now we'll talk about standard out later. We're just using it for now, but we'll explain how, how and why this works. So let's run our code. And as you can see, three records were written, which makes sense. We wrote hello world and note it has, has a header on header zero and footer on it and footer zero. And when we go to write the other set of data, it also was written as, as a record. So we can consider this one record and this yet another record. And you can see it matches. Now the percent sign is because of how my application ends. So let me fix that percent that we see in the output there. And that's because my program doesn't end with a new line. So I'm in the stub. So I don't want to fix the stub. I want to fix my solution. So let's go look at the solution code. Exercise to command main. And so I want to do a FMT, a print line, and I don't want to print out actually anything other than a new line. And now if I go back and rerun the code, you can see the percent is gone. By having a header and a footer, the receiver can wait until it receives the head to say, oh, I know that this is the start of a message. And then it doesn't end until I receive the footer and whatever is in between that was the payload. So that's the purpose for wrapping things. So we can do more interesting things like you can put in your header, how long the payload is, how much data is expected. You can do a checksum to make sure that it's not corrupted or changed, a number of things. you can. That's it for your exercise. Welcome to lecture three in section 10. In this lecture, I wanna take a look at the OS package, but specifically as it relates to how it deals with files or help you deal with files. So, we will be looking at the OS packages and some of the types and functions that it provides, but we'll sort of restrict our view for the most part on file IO, which usually means input output operations, right? Um, that means we're going to be looking at how to create files, how to write data to files, how you open existing files, or you read data from file. We'll also talk a little bit towards the end when we do a review of this lecture about some of the general other things that the OS package offers. If you think about a file and what you know about a file, being able to store data like your source code and so on, and what kind of operation you might desire to work with a file, what are some of the things that, in other words, that you think are appropriate file operation? So of course, that would be being able to create a file if one doesn't exist, open an existing file, being able to store data or write to a file, as we usually say, uh, retrieving data that's in a file or reading. And of course, being able to close a file to signal that you know, you, you're not gonna be putting any more data in this file. Being able to rename files, delete a file, change file permission, and a whole host of other things, right? So, and you know, like getting um, the size of a file, when it was last modified, being able to go to a specific offset within a file. So there are a number of other things you might wanna do. Um, and those are all desirable file operations. In Go, these desired operations are available for you, but they sort of split between what the OS package itself offers and what is attached to the file type as a method, right? So that means that there's a file type declaring the OS package, but on that type, if you have a file value, you can invoke methods in it. And it's not all the methods that you think might be there. Some are just by provided by the OS as function. So the OS is responsible for something like file creation. At that point, you don't have a value or file value to be able to say, I want to create. So reasonable people can disagree on whether this should be this way. Maybe you have a file object, say, set the name of it, and then you say file create, right? Based on the name that I've given you. But the OS package is slightly different. It is responsible for creating file. It is responsible for opening the file. So once it creates the file, open the file, then it gives you a valid file value that you can then use for doing other things. It is also the OS is responsible for doing like renaming the file or deleting the file. It'd be kind of weird actually if you had a file and you said, well, delete yourself. What does that really mean? What is the value of that object after you say, 
that this file is deleted or tell it to delete itself. And many other things the OS package um, provides. So in terms of what you can do with a file once you have it, well, you can then ask the file to read from itself um, or let you write data to the file. You can then say to the file that you want to close it and you want to modify the file permission. And there are other things that you can, might want to do also to a valid file once you have it. And so let's imagine we have a file. Then we might say, well, okay, some of the operation we said that's all we might want to do is like being able to write to that file. And if we add a method like this attached to the file, um, then we can see that this looks very much, and it is, the writer interface if a file were to have this method. Same thing um, when it comes to reading from a file. And so a file implements these interfaces already for us. That's one of the reasons why we cover interfaces for us and the IO um, package, because those interfaces are reused widely in a lot of places and um, within Go itself in the standard packages. And you're going to find out how you're going to start reusing them once you sort of get how simple they are to use. And there's actually a closer interface. And we mentioned the closer interface in passing in our last lecture. And of course, you want to be able to do things that get the file name. And there are other methods to attach the file, but these are sort of like the most important ones you need to be able to do pretty much anything on a file. Let's stop here with slides and diagrams and let's jump into the code and sort of get our fingers dirty. So here I am in my Visual Studio Code editor. And what I've added is simply import statement for FMT and the OS package. Now, notice that what I have is a variable to a pointer call os.file. We can see by just hovering over this type that file is a struct defined in the OS pack. It has some other things defined in that struct and we could see that oh, it's a pointer to some other thing called file. This is OS specific and you don't need to worry about it. All we need to know is that this type file is available for us to use. Now, most of the time, you won't be declaring variables of the OS that file type. Usually, you get it as a return from some other function. And we'll see that in very next example. We can run this code. It doesn't do anything. I mean, you can imagine that, oh, the value there is a pointer, so it's going to be nil. I just want us to start off with something that we're comfortable with. And then you can see it's a pointer to a type. So there's nothing there. So let's look at this example. So this is very similar to what I said before is that we use the OS to create file. And for example, we ask the OS to create a file for us. And notice how easy this is. We simply give it a string of the file name we want to create. And it returns, as you can see, a pointer to the file or an error. So we simply check to see if we get an error. And you will note this in most Go programs that do deal with things like um, file creation or anything like that, that, that allocates resource that needs to be cleaned up especially if it, it involves closing it. Once you have determined that you've successfully allocated that resource, like in this case, so we must close that file. And so we do a defer on that close because we don't want to think about all the different ways that we might exit our program after this point and when we should and if we should call close. So by deferring it, we know that Go is going to take care of this for us before main return. And so that's a canonical way of doing things in Go. So now that you have a file, what can you do with it? Well, file has the method write string. Another thing we can do is use io.write string and just pass it the file because a file implements the writer interface, io writer interface. So that's yet another way in which we can write a string to a file. So let's run this. If we look, we'll see that we do not have this data.txt file. But if we run our program, it doesn't give us any error. But if we look, we now have this file called data.txt. And we can see this from within our IDE. If we open the Explorer view, we can click there and we can see um, the text that we've written to this file. So let's look at this example. And in this example, I'm importing our record writer. So why do I want a record writer? Well, what if I want to write this data as record into the file? So I create a new record writer. Given it that file, it returns to me a writer. Since my record writer did not have the write string method, I had to use io.write string. That's the only reason I really had to change it. And so now I can write those the same data to the file, but pass it through the record writer first, and the record writer would wrap these in records as we have seen before. So if we rerun our application, 
but we can see that our data is in the file. So it recreated the file, overwriting it. So we should say raw data file, all right? And we give the file a name. And this is what I mentioned before, is that a file knows its name. So we have seen using OS to create a file, file that close to close the file, and file that name to get the name in the file. We've used other things that we already know exist for writing data to a writer. And so that wasn't anything new. Okay, so in this example, if no file name is provided, then we use data.txt. If a file name is provided, then we use that. And then I simply use that string and open a file. And so I can check to see if I was able to open that file. If I was able to open the file, I default closing. Now in this example, all I wanna show is how you open and close a file, which you see we've been closing a file already. I can do go run main without providing a name. It will try, or an argument, it will try to open the file data.txt. What if I give it another name to open? Well, I can give it um, some non-existent name like data, and I should expect to see an error message. That's exactly what I get. It says no such file or directory exists. That is one because it didn't know which one we were trying to open. So this is the int of something that is consistent in Go. A file and a directory are being represented by the same thing. And you'll see that in the exercise for this lecture, you're gonna be able to open a directory just like you open a file, and gonna be able to navigate the content of that directory using that file object. So far, we have created a file, write data to it, close the file, and then we try open an existing file in our previous example, and we closed it. And so here, I haven't changed that. So I open the file, I still have the file open. So since I have access to the file, I can read from it. So I'll just create a slice of 500 bytes now. I don't know if that's enough or not, but I think it's enough for the data that we have in our file here. That's the data I'm going to read because I haven't changed anything. So it's still gonna read our data that text file by default, unless I give it a different file. I simply call f.read and that returns the number of bytes. And of course the B contains the data. And if my read was successful, I simply cast that to a string. I don't wanna print all 500 bytes because I don't know if I actually read 500 bytes. If I read less, then I wanna print out only up to how much bytes I've read. So let's run this. Any other file name, so I wanna use this by default. And notice we're able to read our file. So I wanna do one other thing. Now if I, I can use this to read any file. Now we know that if you ask it to read a file that doesn't exist, it will fail. So if we said data, for example, let's build it. And so now I have an executable called lecture zero three. And now I can use that to read any file. And it's not just our data file. Cause remember, if we don't pass a name, it read data.txt, but we can read any file we want. And so for example, I can catch a file. Like, and now I can run my program on a.txt and which shows the contents of that file. So essentially what we have just written is this program called cat because I can call cat on any file and see the contents of it. And that is exactly what our program does. It cat the contents of a file. And there's a much better way of doing this. Of course, our program have a limitation of 500 bytes but we can make sure that it copies out all the data from a file by using copy instead. And we want to copy to the standard output, which we haven't talked about this yet, standard out. And the source is our file. And so this will do the exact same thing we've been doing so far. So we will go build, and then we run our program, and notice it looks exactly like the cat program. All right, so again, how easy was this to build? Ignoring these set of lines is really just three lines of code that you require to build a CAT program. So that's it in terms of the lecture. I hope that you find file operation very easy and intuitive and consistent in Go. At least I find it that way given that I've tried this sort of thing in other languages. If this is your first time, well, this is one of the easiest um, to use. Please look at the uh, exercise supplemental video for this lecture's exercise and a supplemental video is also provided for, to review some of the material and talk a little bit more about the OS package. Take care. See you in the next lecture. Bye.
Let's review your exercise for section 10, lecture 3. So this will be exercise 03. And I'm calling this my tree as the exercise name. So let's read what it's about first of all. So we want to write a Go application by the name of my tree, which comes with total number of files and directory for the specified paths. So you can be given one path, two paths, and actually no path. And we'll see what I mean. We're patterning our command after the tree command that's in units. So let me show you what a tree command look like first. So if I am in this directory and I type tree, it's go through and it look at the summary. It tells me how many directories there are, how many files, but it also lists this nice tree so I can see um, what the structure of that directory looks like. Now there are a number of options that you can pass to the tree command and if Windows doesn't have this command and more likely it doesn't, well, this is an example of how you can write something very simple that's similar, doesn't have all the capabilities as you'll see, it's very much simplified, but at least it gives you some of the capabilities. Now, one of the problems that I have with tree is that I tend to work with a lot of files and very nested and deep directory structures. And so if I want to be able to just see a total of how many directories and full files they are, well, tree has no way of limiting that information, the information. All I really want is this line. But then because I have deeply nested directories and sometimes thousands of files, well, it has to go through and list all of it. Now, the reason why I like using tree though is because it tells me how many directories or files that I have. I can do that separate to get this information with two separate commands using find. But being able to do it from one command is great. The only problem is I have no way of limiting it. For example, I can say tree, limit your search to level one, for example. I just tell me all the files in directory at this level, or I can say level two. But it still doesn't nest. And even when I specify the minus capital R option for recursive, because I specified a level, well, it's limited to that level even with the minus R, so it does not recurse. So I can do find and then do something minus files to so just see all the files and then pass that to word count minus L. And I'll get a number of file and I can do the same thing to get the number of directories. So I figure why not write my own little Go application that simply goes through and find all the files and directories and simply list those only. And so that is what it's doing. So that's why I call it a tree like or my tree to simply print and out this in. Very, very simple. And so the other thing that we can do is notice when I run tree without any option, it does the current directory by default, or I can specify a directory. I can say this current directory, the parent directory, or maybe my temp directory or any other directory. Okay. So we're going to do, and you could specify multiple directories also. So if we do a ls here, we see it. we have some directories. I can say I want a lecture 04 directory directory and lecture 04 directory. And so we do three for those and it counts the result to total. And so why this application? Well, we just learned how in Go, it's easy to create file, open files, write data to file and read files. But we also said that a file in Go and generally in Unix is really also a directory if you think about it a file just have data a directory has data too the data just happen to be about other file entries and other directories within that directory so a directory really is just a fancy file and so go give us some abstraction above this so that we don't really have to read the data from a directory file your course and then try to interpret it but rather we can say get things like get the list of directory entries and if we go to the OS page and let's look at, for example, uh, let's do index. So if you look at the file type, it has a method. Once you have a file value, it has a method for read directory, which return file info objects or file info values, a slice of file info, info values, or you can get a slice of string. So this is what we will use to navigate our directory. For us, this is very easy. We'll be given a list of files or directories to count, and we'll simply get the file info for it. And if it's a file, we simply count it as a file. If a directory, we count it as a directory, and then we re repeat the process recursively. 
And why we can do this with a file info? Well, once you have a file info object, you can call or is directory to get information about whether this file is a directory or not. That is basically the gist of it. So let me show you what this looks like once it's compiled and running. And so this gives us a my tree and I can say my tree and enter and you can see it says zero directory and two files. And if I use the built-in tree command, I get essentially the same thing. And so if we make a crazy path, something like that, and I can do this on Unix, or I do touch, and let's see, I touch files in AB and something like that. And now I run tree on that, or my current I tree, it looks like that. But if I run my tree, it just tell me I have four directories and four files. If you want to be able to do something like this, where you try to draw or output what the structure actually look like, notice the directories are listed for us, but it's not that difficult to do. If you look in the solution, you'll see some hints on how to do it. It doesn't complete the picture, but at least you'll see that how it does do the indentation and use some of these characters to draw some of the pictures. So you can use that if you wanted to reduce this sort of thing. So that's your exercise. Good luck. Welcome to lecture four, section 10. And in this lecture, we're going to be talking about formatted output. Now we've been using FMT package all this time from the very beginning to write formatted output. So now we're going to dive a little bit deeper, not too deep. This is still an introductory course at least a little bit deeper than what we have done before. So we're gonna talk, like I said, about formatted output. And specifically, we'll talk about writing to standard out. One of the things that you might have heard me mention before is standard input and standard output. But in this lecture, I will formally introduce you to standard out. Since we're gonna be talking about formatted output only, well, we really only need to focus on standard out. And in the next lecture, we'll talk about standard in. And specifically, we're gonna look at the set of functions that's provided in the FUMP package, FMT package, that has to do or write to standard out. Additionally, we'll look at how you can write formatted data or text to a string, and there are functions also provided in FUMP package, and those begin with the S character, and so those will be your S print, your S print line, and S print F. And notice how they sort of mirror the one that write to standard out, which are just print, print line, and print F. Finally, we'll look at the ones that write to just any generic IO writer or essentially any generic file. And we'll see that those look like F print, F print line, and F print F. Now, if you come from C or C, these look very familiar. Why? Because they actually derive from the C version. And so we will go through and see how you can sort of build these up and then we'll play with it a little bit. So let's go take a look at some code. So here I am in my Visual Studio Code Editor and let me close this Explorer to give us some more room. And what I'm gonna start with is a slice of strings. So I've just made up some strings and right now I have four of them. And so we know how we can write this to the screen, but right now, I want to use something that we've done before. I want to write it to a file. And so we know that we can create a file by using os.create, give it a string, and we get back a pointer to a os.file value. What I want to do is loop over the data or iterate over the slice of strings that I have. And I will use io.write string because I know they are strings. I'll use io.write string to write them to output or write them to that file. And so we can run this and we know what's going to happen. So if we look in our directory, we have, we don't have the data.txt file and we don't have an error. And you can see now we have our data.txt file. And if we do data.txt, we should see all the text that we try to write to our file. And it is indeed the exact same thing. So let's look at this new example. Only thing that's different really is just this part that's really new. As you can see, this part didn't really change and which is identical to this part above here. But notice something different. I'm assigning to my out variable, which we know is a pointer to os.file. I'm assigning to it os.standardout, 
Well, standard out is a variable created by the OS package for you to manage standard output. And so it operates just like a file. You could see the documentation tell you that standard in, standard out, and standard error, which we'll talk about much later, are open file pointing to the standard input, standard output, and standard error file descriptors. If that's confusing to you, don't worry about file descriptors. File descriptors are just basically numbers that the Unix operating system or Unix Lite operating system use to manage files. And we call it a file descriptor. It's a way to look up and get information about a file and so on. But all we need to know is that it looks just like any file we can create. And therefore, and since it's already created by the go run time for us, we can just simply write to it. And so what we should expect is that I'm going to be able to write to something that looks like a file and let's see where it shows up. And if I do go run main to run this example now, notice this time I'm getting data on the screen. So every time we write and we see something display on our screen, chances are it's either being written to standard out or standard error. For us, for the moment, we're going to say standard out and not worry about standard error. So this is exactly how it is that we can write and we've been writing data to the screen is by using OS that standard out. It just so happened that it was hidden from us. But notice we can do it directly ourselves. And we don't have any FM function in this um, example program. All we're using is the OS and IO. So let's look at this other example. So this is different from what we had before. And what I've done is I have some code that we've written previously. This should look familiar. We wrote our own print line function, and here it is. We did this in section nine, where we're looking at how we can pass an interface to a function and detect what on the line type and value it's storing. And we call this type assertion. So using this type switch, we we're able to switch on the specific type that was actually stored in this interface variable. Now, this prints out a lot of information that at the time we wanted to see that we detected a Boolean and we had the Boolean value that corresponded to it. And let's just still make sure that all this code still works. And it does. So let's see how we can work ourselves closer to what FUMP print functions are doing. And that's what I'm doing. I'm building it up slowly. So let's look at another example. And the only thing I've changed really with print line is I went from having the parameter V being an interface value, a singular value, I made it a variadic function. And what I need to do if I'm going to accept multiple values, iterate over those values. And notice now that when I switch, because I know what type of value I'm going to be accessing, I don't need to print out that string, all that noise that we were doing before. And the other thing I had to do was I want, since I have multiple values that I can potentially pass to my function, well, I want to separate each value with a space. Now, if I only print out one value, as, as in the case of our example, I don't really want to print a space. But if my for loop is processing multiple values, then I'll print a space. So let's run this and see how it's different from what we had before. So if I run this now, notice it's still print the same things, it's just without the noise. Okay, let's continue. If we look at this piece of code, I haven't changed anything in main. And what I've done is I've simply said that my print line function should delegate its work to a print function. Why? Because if we call in print line and it's always adding a new line, well, I might as well just call a print function that prints out our value if we want it without a new line, and then print line simply add a new line if we want to be a little bit lazy. This V comes in looking like a slice. Print itself also accept a variadic parameter. So what we do is we tell go to expand that slice into individual values for that function. But other than that, notice none of our code really changed except function name went from print line to print. Let's run this and we should see that the result is not any different than what we had before because we haven't done anything other than delegated the work. So let's look at another example. Again, I'm building up slowly to our FUMP package work and hopefully you start seeing a pattern because we already have print line and we have print, two functions we can call independently. So once again, let's look at this example. Print itself now has changed. Print delegates its work to a function called sprint. But sprint 
returns a string of whatever it is that we want to print. Now, since we have a string of what we want to print, we can simply call font to do the printing for us. Now, this is one of the places where we're actually going to be showing that we're using font, but notice our footprint on FUMP has been reduced from instead of us calling that every other place in this case statement, we now call it from one place. That's because our sprint function simply accumulates all the result that it needs to print out into a string first. So if you look at how we're now processing our values, we're saying that if we know it's a Boolean, well, then we know the value is either true or false. And based on that, we can return a string representing that value. Same thing for an int. If we know that we're processing an int, we can simply call some function that we've written to turn our integer value into a string. And similarly, our float value into a string, complex value into a string. And so if we have a string, well, then of course, we can simply just append it. And then in this case, we could write a function that knows how to turn our pointer to a person into some representation that we can then also add to the string. And if we don't know what we should do, well, we should have some, maybe we have some function called unknown to string that does, you know, write out the appropriate message. Now, I sort of cheated a little bit. And if you look above, I said it all, we only use in fumped one place. That's not true. I'm still using fumped to return those strings for me, but I'm using the fump as print function, which is the same function that I myself am trying to define. But we'll fix this in a little bit. Okay, so given all of this, with this delegation from print line to print and from print to sprint, we still want to make sure that we haven't changed our output. So let's run our code again. And I'm leaving it on the screen and you can see that it still look exactly the same way. So the last example, what we're trying to do is get an understanding and intuitive feel of how a FUMP package has these functions like print line and so on. And so if we now look at our main application, as you can see, we said that we had sprint, which really took our parameters and turned them into a string. Now we have print that's calling out to some fprint function, not sprint only, but now that it has a string, it's calling out to fprint. It says, oh, is a standard output? sending it to this fprint function along with the string. Now we can see that all the heavy work is being done by sprint to take our values and turn them into string. And fprint is simply using io.write string to write to some particular io writer. Once we have fprint, well, then we can then just use print to specify that that writer by default is OS that standard out. Hopefully this clear up the mystery on all those from print line, print, sprint, and all of those. And now you're probably, hopefully more comfortable using them. So we didn't look at the formatted one, which end with F, but all that means is it gives direction on how to interpret the corresponding parameters. See you in the next lecture. Good luck. Take care. Bye. Let's take a look at your exercise for lecture four in section 10. So in this exercise, what we would like to do is look at how we can convert an int or a float value to a string. Now let's review where this comes from. So in lecture four, we're looking at some of our examples. And what we did was we sort of hide the details of how we can convert an integer value to a string. And we simply say we're going to call this int string function. Well, our int string function actually just turn around and call the sprint function from the font package. But now we want to implement our int string so that it actually take an integer and return a string without using any other helper package. And so that is what we want to look at. So if we look at the to do on the requirements, your function signature should look like int to string. It should take an int and return a string. And in the function must not use any of the standard package in the implementation. Now, part of the trick to doing this is to use modulus operation. And specifically, if you think about it, if we have an integer value and we were to divide it by 10 using modulo division, then we'll get the remainder. And that remainder can be reused 
as a way to tell us which number fell out from that integer and then we can use that to look up the string because any value will simply be between 0 and 9 because those are the only digits we have. So once you've been able to write this function into string, I just do this basically repeatedly, but give it a, some thought and try it. But of course the solution is here and we'll run it and see. But once you have that written, then you can try doing float to string. Now we're only doing two of them here and it's not the best implementation. And there are some quirks with our implementation of float to string. And that's because floats in themselves are a little bit quirky, but the idea is only to demonstrate that it's possible to do this integer or numeric conversion to string. So let's go look at how we can run our program and see what it looks like. So, and we'll do go run and we'll do main. And what we're trying to do is print out, and I could guarantee you these values all came from our implementation of our function into string and float to string. And we can see that here. If we look in main, we can see we're using IO write string standard output int to string. And I give it 2010 plus a new line because I, this returns a string. And then I give it this number that's divided that eventually just becomes 40. And it prints that out correctly. And integer is doing well. When it comes to float, some of them it can process well, like 915. But when we have 1104, for example, there we go, 1104, it seems to have some problem about with the precision and how floating point numbers are stored. But give it some thought and think about using modulo 10 and how you can use it in a loop to try and drive your answer towards a string. Welcome to lecture five in section 10. In this lecture, we're gonna be talking about formatted input. Now, in our previous lecture, we look at formatted output. And we went through a lot of examples to show how we can take our print line function, which we developed in section nine, where we're looking at type assertion and sort of tweak it until it sort of look like some of the function that you get in the font package and specifically the print ones. In this lecture, we're not going to do that. I just did that for illustration purposes. So. Let's see what we're going to be covering in this lecture. So our topic is to look again at formatted input, and we're looking at the ones that read from standard in. Formatted output write by default to standard out when you use the print related functions. And now we can see that when you use the scan function, which we have not used so far in this course, but it by default will read data from standard input. And we can see there's a variety of them. There's the scan, scan line and scan f the other one is the one that reads from a string and this mirrors the print s print variety which writes to a string now we're saying that if we have a string and we want to read from that string we can use s scan and we can use s scan s scan line and s scan f okay finally there is being able to read from any io reader f scan f scan line and f scan f so let's jump right into looking at some code. So here I am in my Visual Studio Code Editor, and we're looking at Lecture 5. And so I'll close this to give us some room. And so I'm starting with an input um, string. So let's imagine that I have some inputs I got somewhere, and it's stored in a string. Now I make a note here that there's also the string conversion pack package that you can use, which is also a standard package. And you can do other things like parse in, parse float, and so on. And you should definitely take a look at that. But in this lecture, I want to focus on the font package and how you can read data from it, get formatted data input. If you notice, what we need to do before we can use scan is to say we need a place in which we can store the result. So in this case, since I intend to read this as an integer, well, I have a variable called int a, essentially, a is an integer. And when I call S scan, I'm saying I want to scan a string. That's where the capital S is for. And so before scan. And so I specify the string where I want to scan from. And then I specify the a pointer to the location where I should store what is it that I want to try and scan. Notice I'm not using format specifier to tell it that, oh, you know what? I'm actually trying to scan an integer because Go 
can detect or derive that since my variable is an integer, therefore I'm trying to scan an integer. And so let's run our code and see if I get 42. And there it is. So that is how easy it is for us to scan something from a string. But let's look at some other example where we try to scan like float and other strings from a string. So let's look at this example. So just as before, I have an input string, of course a little bit longer now with some additional things. And I intend to scan an integer value, a float, and two strings from my input. So why am I trying to scan two strings? Well, I'm hoping that I can scan this as a string, right? Something like this. Scan this as an integer. Scan this social security number as a string. And then scan this as a float. So looking at those order of how the values are in the string, I can imagine that if I say s scan from a string, from this input, I want to scan a string and i, my integer, then I want to scan another string followed by my float. And so let's run this and see if it works. And we run our code. And it does not work. I have an empty string for s2 and only Jane for s1. So what happened? Well, it looks like when I try to scan a string, that s scan stops as soon as it reach a white space. And a white space can be anything like a new line, or tab or space. And so even though it would look to you and I that we can go much farther in terms of scanning a string, that is now what happened. And so if I actually want to scan this correctly, what I need is another string variable, for example, let's call it string two. And what I'll do instead is scan into S1 and then make this S2. And let's print that out. And so the logic is this. S1, S0 will contain Jane, and scan will skip over the space, consume it, scan into S1, do, skip over the space, scan my integer, skip over the space, and then scan my next string, S2, and then, of course, consume eventually my float. So let's see if that works. So if I run that now, and you can see none of my string value have spaces in them, that is because scan consume white spaces. It uses the white space as delimiter between the values. So for scan, these look like this is one value, this is another value, this is another value, and this is another value because it's using the space to delimit. And I strongly encourage you to read the documentation for the FUM package and especially on how scanning works because there are a few things you should note. One particular important thing to note is this note at the bottom that tells you how it's possible that scan or all this that scan function, if it was F scan, scan um, itself or S scan can skip value. Now that shouldn't occur with the standard when you read on the standard in because that implementation have a way to unread a rune. And when you read this, it will make sense. Basically it means that if it reads something that it shouldn't have, it can put it back. But if you're using a reader that doesn't do that, then you might end up skipping value. Without that note, things should work fine. So, so far we've been scanning from just string. Let's take a look at another example. So in this example, I haven't changed much. Only thing I've done is now added new lines between where I had formerly had spaces. And the reason I've done that is I want to show you that if you decide to use a scan line, the difference is you're saying, I want you to stop when you encounter a new line, which means if this documentation is correct about how scan line work, it should read only Jane because it still will see that this first value or this first value is space delimited, then it will read do into S1. And because it encounters a new line and we're using scan line, it's gonna say stop reading and it does not consume the integer. So let's take a look at that. And so that's exactly what we have. We have Jane and do only because it encountered a new line. So this is our last example about scan. So in this example, we're going to be reading from a file. Now we're going to read from a file. The file we're going to read from is this file, data.txt. It's just a simple file. It has exactly the same information we had in the string. And what I want to do 
is open the file and if I can successfully open it, now the only difference is our input instead of being a string is a file. Notice I haven't really changed anything other than to say that I'm using F scan line instead of S scan. So let's run this code. And as you can see, we're able to read and consume data from our file. And we can confirm that by changing this to Mary and then changing this to 74. And yeah, for example, this is six. So, and let's have that save. And then we go back to our code here and we reread and notice that we have the same result. This is just reading from a file, but we can easily change this to say, I want to read from standard in instead. So for that, we can just say input is equals to os.standard in. And remember, standard in is a file that the operating system opens for us. So we don't have to worry about closing it because the OS is managing that for us. And so now if we just rerun our code, it's prompting us for input. We don't see that because we didn't say we should have a prompt. No, that's output. We should have written that oh, please enter some input, but let's write something anyway. If you remember, we had some text that we could write followed by some more text, I believe. Well, actually, let's take a look and see what it's expecting. It's expecting us to have text number and then text and then vote. Okay, so let's put 25 and then let's put some more text and then we put a float. 3.14, I like 3.14. And if we run this, we can see we, we were able to read that from our input. So as a final example, there's a package called buffered IO, and it's really intended to help you with, when you manipulate a lot of text IO. There are a number of other useful functions and types in buff IO package. So I encourage you, if you're going to do a lot of text stuff, definitely take a look. So in this example, what I want to do is write a program that where you can enter at most a certain number of lines. And if you don't have that many lines, you can terminate processing by entering a empty line. And so in this example, maximum number of line is five. I want to show you how easy it is to do that. So I start off by prompting or giving instructions, and then I write my prompt. My prompt is going to show you which line number you're entering. And as I read each line, I simply make sure that the nine that I'm currently reading is less than the maximum. And I use my scanner to check and to say, scan a line. If scan was able to scan a line, then I can get that text by calling scanner.txt. Now, what is a scanner? A scanner is this thing, this value that I create from buff IO by calling the new scanner function. And what it does is it takes a reader, IO reader, and return a scanner. And as you can see, my IO reader in this case is OS that standard in, which says I want you to read or scan from standard in. So once we loop it around, if when we call our scanner and we get a new line, or if the user enters a new line, scanner consumes the new line and just returns an empty string. So in that case, we know that they didn't enter any text other than a new line, which we don't get. And so we can break out of this for loop. Otherwise, we append our string to our buffer. And so our buffer is just simply a slice of string. And we prompt them again. Once they finish entering lines, what we want to do is call the title function in the strings package to format each line for us as a title. And then we print that out. So let's just run the code and see what this looks like. So let's clean up and run the code. And so here it is prompting me and I can say, I. And then now I want to stop. I press enter. And so that's just a simple example to show you how you can use the scan function or you can use something like buff IO that scanner to take care of when you have multiple words or very long lines of text that you want to scan. So in this case, we didn't have to worry about the space delimiter and so on. We just simply use the scanner and it knows how to deal with lines. Take a look at your exercise. It's built on some of these ideas by see you in the next lecture so let's look at exercise five in lecture 10. so in lecture five what we did was we look at how you scan 
input. And those can be from a string, from standard in, or from just any arbitrary IO reader or anything that implements IO reader. So I figure why not have us write an application which combine a number of things that we've been doing and especially in the last few chapters. And it's a very simple application. So let's read it. Write a Go application which prompts a user for their name. If the user has was seen before, greet them with a welcome back message. If this is a new user, you greet them with a new user message and store the name to the database, followed by the current day and time. No. So what database am I talking about? The database is just a simple file. As a tip, you can use the cal package that's provided with the course, and that give you some helper functions that allow you to get the current date and time. But really, those are just wrapper around the time package. So you can just go look at the time package yourself and see which function you need to be able to say things like today is Friday and the current time is so and so. And so here's an example of how your program might be run. If you run your program, it prompts the user for the name. And when they type the name, you respond with their name in proper case. Notice how they type the name and notice how it prints it out back to them in proper case. And then you say, welcome first time user. And you print out a message. Now, if Jane was seen previously in the system, it would say, welcome back. And so let me show you what it looked like when we run it. And for example, I type, let's type Feral. And I print it, run it, and it says, hi, Vera, welcome first time user, and today, date and time. Now, notice what happens if I rerun the program and I type my name again. And it says, welcome back. How did it know that how it should say welcome back? Well, I'll show you that in a minute because we're using a database. And let's me run it again, and this time I will put Jane. And it says, welcome first time user. Now, what happened is you notice that when I started this program, I did not have a user.db file. Now, I could call it anything I like. It's just a text file. But the user.db file is where I store username information, and all I do is simply list their names so that I can look it up. Now, let's rerun the program again, and notice how I store their name with proper case. But if I run my program and I type lowercase varal, it still know that oh, I am coming back. And that is because of how it does the comparison. So take care of all those things to make sure that oh, you're not trying to store the same user with different cases over and over. Let's go over the lab for section 10. So in this section, the lab is called Command Runner. And I think it's a really cool application. And I just show you how powerful Go is and still very simple and understandable. Now, the application we're going to do, it doesn't seem like you really would need something like this um, in the way we're going to be developing and using it. But in the next section, when we talk about network programming, we'll extend this very same application to make it so it's something we can use across over the network. But for now, let's just focus on trying to get it to work on our computer. The objective of this program is for your application to run another application. By that, what I mean is let's call your application command zero, and it will be given, your application will be given some other options, some other values that it must use to run another application. And the requirements are, given a command and its argument, your program should be able to run that command. It should also be able to capture the output from that command, such that it can tell how many bytes the application or the command it ran produced, and how many times that application wrote to it. Remember when we did the um, write counter, when we extended it so that not only does it keep track of how many times write is called, but also how many bytes were given to it? Well, that's essentially what you're going to be reusing, but we're going to see how we're going to be able to use it with a subcommand or a command that we run so that when that command writes it output, it comes to our um, write counter. So before we jump into the code, Let's see if we can get an illustration of what it is that our application is supposed to do. Let's imagine that our program that we're going to write in Go is called command zero. When we run our command, we know that oh, we pass it some arguments, which comes in as os.args. And so that is going to be arg zero, which is the name of our command, arg one, any other arguments to our command, and so on. Now, once our application starts running, 
it gets assigned standard in, which is, as we know now, is a file that's open by the operating system and between Go and the operating system so that we can receive input from our keyboard, for example, wherever our standard in is tied to. And we also get standard out, which is generally by default, unless you change or your system is configured differently, tied to your monitor or your display or terminal, whatever you like to use. So the thing that we want to do is have our program start running a second command or another program, which that other command is going to be given. The name of that other command is going to be given by arg1. So our application, when it look at arg1, it should say, oh, this is the command that I need to run. And of course, we know that second command also have its arguments. And those arguments are going to come from our program arguments. But also that command, when it start running, it will get its own standard in and standard out. All application get their own standard in and standard out. And what we want to do is to be able to redirect or assign our standard in to the standard in of that command we're going to run. That way, as we type into our program, it goes straight into that command that we're trying to run. This seems difficult, but you see how easy it is for us to do it in a minute. Then we want the output from this subcommand that we run to go to our write counter. Now remember, we implemented write counter before, which is just an IO writer. And therefore, we're going to be able to tie the standard out of that subcommand to our IO writer. Therefore, anything that the subcommand writes goes through our IO writer, where we log how many bytes and how many times it's called, but then we can also send that to our standard out, which means our, our program that's running the subcommand. And therefore, it can come out to the monitor. This look a little bit like a serious contortion, but it's fairly easy to do. We're going to extend this in the next section to say, what if we could run this application on a remote system and send it the commands that we need to run? Imagine that how we can send it the command and the arguments over the network and have the, our program that's running remotely on that other system do the same thing, invoke the command, take keyboard input from us over the network and then send us back the results. So that's what we're building up to, but first we have to start simple. So, okay, so let's jump to the code and take a look. So because this is a little bit of a stretch and I wanna show you some of the other things that you can do in the OS package, I am going to review the code that I wrote. In any application, you can always implement things any number of ways. There are many ways to solve the same problem. The thing to keep in mind, is that if you want to try it first, I suggest you stop here and you know what the requirements are, or you can read the requirements here. It's exactly what I showed in the slide. Very simple and straightforward application. And you can go look at OS slash exec package. This package has example and documentation for how we're going to be able to launch a command from Go. And there it is. We call the command function, give it the name of the command we want to run and the arguments, and it returns this command value to us. And then it's that value that we use then to run or even connect our standard input and standard output. So that's really it. Let's go through the code. It's so simple that I actually have it all in one file. So let's start with our write counter. We've seen this before. We have type write counter, and we have the count of how many times write is going to be called in this object and how many bytes going to pass through it. We can then scroll to the bottom and look at the implementation for the IO write interface. So let me close this. And it's very simple. We make sure that we don't have a nil value. If we do, then we simply return. And otherwise, we increment how many times we've been called and we tally up the number of bytes. We also return OS that standard out that write. What this means is we simply write the standard out. Remember, we're going to send whatever comes from that application through our write counter. We're going to send it to our standard out. Now let's look at the application. We ensure that we have more than one command line argument. This means that uh, if we only have one, it's just the program or program name that was used and we didn't have any arguments, so there's nothing to do. So we exit the program. But if we have at least one argument, then we know that is the program name. If we have at least two arguments, we know one is our application or program name and the other is the name of the application we need to run or the command we need to run. Then we check to see if there are more than two arguments. 
If there are more than two arguments, then those are the arguments that we must pass to the program or the command that we're to this command that we're going to run given by stored in name. We use the exec that command function, give it the name of the program and the argument. And because this is a slice and command express a set of argument string as a variadic parameter, well, we just tell it to, ex to go to expand our slice into individual value and call this function. We have the command that is returned and on that object or that value, we can now attach the standard in of that command, we can set it equal to the standard in of our program. So which means that if a user type anything into our program, it goes straight through to this command that we're trying to run. And we create a new write counter. And now we attach that write counter to the standard out of that command. So which means when this command runs, I try to write out something, it's going to be right into our write counter object, which we see already is simply something that tally up the byte and write the data out to standard out. So we just act as a pass through. We then try to run the command and run will block until the command we launch exits. And we don't check for any error or anything in this application, but you can certainly do that uh, because we don't know if the command was actually run launched successfully, but we'll ignore that. And after we finish running the command, Remember, whatever that command wrote to the screen went straight to the screen. We didn't stop it from going to the screen. All we did was count, do some accounting and let it pass through. At the end of the command running, we simply print out some data that we've collected, and that includes the number of bytes and how many times we were called. Let's build it this time. Okay, so now we have a new application, and we do command runner, and we run it without. There's a simple application, which we have built already, Echo. And so let's say Echo. And we say, hi. So echo is the command. The arguments we provided to echo was hi. So if we run our own program and say, we want you to run echo the command, but this is just a string to our command. So we don't really care. It's just a string. And we also want you to pass this as argument. So we want hi. And we could pass more than one, but let's just start off with one, make sure that works. And so we run it and you can see our program ran the echo command, passed it this argument and the echo command wrote high, which came out through the standard out. And because we we're doing some accounting, we were able to capture that on the three bytes because there's a new line in the output. So we see the two character on the new line, which we can't see. And only once was right call. Now let's see if we can pass more arguments. So if I pass echo, if I say echo, hello world, it prints out hello world. So I should be able to run this exact same command. Oh, let's do this. And I should get the same result. And there you go. We can do this with essentially any program. We can say, let's run the ls program. And that's what ls of our directory that we're in is giving us. We can run ls of any directory. So for example, we could run ls of the temp directory and the little contents of my ten directory at this moment. Well, this is what I'm saying. If we can run this application, keep our application running as a TCP socket application server, we could should be able to send it commands. So instead of passing it commands that we're doing now and it run it and exit, we can keep it running and just send it commands that we want to run and then have it send us back the output of that command and accept from us any input or whatever we need to type to that command. So for example, let's say we were to run the cat program. So if we run cat and we say cat uh, like this, So notice as I enter each line, cat spits out whatever I enter for that line. So if you want to end the pro cat program, you do control D. Okay. So I am saying that we can still run the cat program through our program. So right now the cat sub, sub program is running and reading from the standard in of our program. So if we type now, 
now you see and because cat program is also written directly to the standard out of our program it shows up immediately and i'll type control d again to exit and you can see we had to write two times which is exactly where we had two lines written and then those are the number of bytes so that is the application if you try this without looking at my solution i hope it worked for you if it didn't then definitely look at how i did it it's very very it's one of the shortest labs we've written since leaving section two